The Radio Memories Network is brought to you in part by Liberated Syndication. Podcast publishing made easy. Libsyn.com. That's L I B S Y N.com. Escape. Escape tonight to Paris of 500 years ago. The Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations presents Escape, a new series of programs of which this, the fifth, is The Sire de Maltois' Door by Robert Louis Stevenson, produced and directed by William N. Robeson. The pen of Robert Louis Stevenson has been an avenue of escape for three generations. Our grandparents thrilled to the macabre metamorphosis of Dr. Jekyll, just as we will never forget the nursery menace called Long John Silver. Tonight we escape with Robert Louis Stevenson down another avenue, which leads to Paris in 1429, and the amazing adventure of The Sire de Maltois' Door. Dark of the Moon, 1429, Paris. The House of Burgundy holds the throne of France, and English men-at-arms patrol the narrow streets. Troublous times for any man to be lost, on foot, at night. Psst. You there! Over here, here by the wall. What's this? Now the shadows themselves are speaking. I'm no shadow. A real life human being. I've managed to get myself lost in these confounded alleys. Can you tell me where I am? Well, now, fine young cavalier, no less. And he's lost. I'm trying to find the Beausant Inn. Will this street lead me there? Ah, that one street is as good as another, and none of them will ever lead a man anywhere. Oh, come now. You must know something about this part of Paris. Think, man, a patrol may pass at any moment. Hmm? Oh, you're wanted. I have a safe conduct pass from the captain of the garrison. Safe conduct, he says. And a fine lot of good that'll do you here in the dark of the night. Well, you're certainly not helping my chances any. No, lad. The only safe conduct you have is that sword is swinging at your side. Wait, wait, quiet. A patrol. They're coming this way. I am inclined to think you're right. I've got to run for it. Tell them nothing. Then I should tell what to whom. Wait, halt! Someone's there. Speak up. Who are you? Speak up, is it? And you a blundering pack of two-day grenadiers that walk like a herd of cattle such as me, speak up, that served with a mad Prince Charlie himself. <laughs> May you rest in peace. <laughs> An old campaigner, eh? Hey, where you from, soldier? Fontainebleau, from a smarter outfit in bivouac than the likes of you in quarters. <laughs> <laughs> a bit in the scrub, sir, man. Uh, seen anybody about, old-timer? No, but shadows and uh, tankards of air. Uh. Fine French cavalier who departed hence without a bio lead just What's now. That? Where'd he go? Oh, who knows? Perhaps he went one way, maybe the other. Though I, I think it was the other there. All right, men. I'm... French cavalier, huh? We'll have him like a fowl in a spit. Spread out. Cover the street. Keep an eye out. Don't let him slip away between you. Forward now. Touch every corner. <laughs> Fool, the drunken fool. I'm for it now, all right. Ah, this cross street. There's a bare chance they'll pass it by. If I can only get through here. Oh, oh. No. oh no. It's a dead end, unless this leads. No, it's only the door to a house. Caught like a rat in a trap. All right. If it's so written, then so be it. With a bit of luck, there'll be two or three go with me. Huh? The door. It's unlocked. I can push it open. Huh. Black as the mouth of hell inside. Well, what have I got to lose? I'm alive now. You have to be here someplace. Huh? Oh, not what? that boy, you dog! 
You see the press above it? He's not here. He's gone. Ah, yeah, that he has. Didn't come in here after all. All right, back to the corner. He's a sly one for sure. Ah. <sighs> That was close. Too close. Ah, now to get out of here and no one in the house will ever be the wiser. I'll do... Huh? What's this? <laughs> the door's locked. Oh, it's a trap. But why? Why would such a thing be done? I came in here by chance. One chance against a million. Wait. It's a light. Somewhere inside the house. What? Well, by all rights, I should be dead at this moment. So? Come in, young man. I've been expecting you all evening. I fear you must be mistaken, sir. My visit is quite unexpected for both of us. <laughs> That's good. That's very good. For the both of us, you say. Well, no matter. You're here. That's the main point. Take a seat, my boy. Put yourself at ease. We'll arrange our little affairs presently. Well, there seems to be some misunderstanding. You see, your door was oh, standing... Oh, at... the door. Ah, that was a little piece of ingenuity. Don't you agree? So you must know that I had no intention of intruding without an invitation. Oh, without an invitation, is it? Well, we old people are used to such reluctance. When it touches our honor, we cast about until we find some way of overcoming it. And so, my boy, invitation or not, you are, believe me, most welcome. I hope you'll pardon my saying it, but I haven't the slightest idea what you're talking about. Oh, so that's it, dead to rights but still pretending, eh? Ah, you're a clever rogue. Sir, right. my name is Denis de Beaulieu. I am not a guest in your house by my own choice, and I am not accustomed Stop. to being... Sli Nor is the house of Maltois accustomed to certain things. Of which you well know. Maltois. I should have expected better treatment at the hands of one of the most honored families of France. Honored indeed. Until you, Monsieur de Beaulieu, took it upon yourself to dishonor us. Sire de Maltois, I have attempted to explain that I took a stand before your door to fight off a patrol which I'd encountered in the street. <laughs> I assure you I had no slight intention of forcing myself up. <laughs> Since it seems impossible for you to converse with any degree of reason, may I bid you good night. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, if you have your right wits, then you're insulting me grossly. And if not, I have no desire to spend further time with a lunatic. You young fool. Thinking to get away so easily. No power on earth can make me stay here any longer. Even if I'm forced to hack that door of yours to pieces. <laughs> I am me. And now, uh, will you please sit down, my dear nephew? Nephew? You lie in your teeth. I said sit down. You think for a minute... But I made a, a little contrivance for the door and stopped short with that. If you want to be bound hand and foot until your bones crack inside of you, then get up. Try to get away. But if you'd rather stay a free young buck, agreeably conversing with an old gentleman, sit where you are in peace. You mean, then, I'm a prisoner here? I stated the facts. Draw your own conclusion. Ah, fair Francois, come in, come in. Thank you, Messiah. Tell me, uh, how is she? A little better frame of mind, I hope. She is more resigned, at least, Messiah. Well, now, isn't she hard to please? A likely stripling such as this, well born, and her own choice. What more would the jade wall have, hmm? If you'll pardon, the situation is not usual for a young damsel. It is somewhat trying to her blushes. Trying, is it? Ha! She should have thought of that before the dance began. She called the terms, and now she will do the At the risk of being presumptuous, may I ask who she is? You hear that, Captain? Monsieur de Bonjour, you must know... A fiery horse with I the speed of light, a cloud of dust, and a hearty high silver. I'm pleased silver. that you find my most casual remarks oh, amusing. Ranger. So, <laughs> you'd like to know who she is. Very well. After all, you really should know, young fella. It's only fitting for you to be introduced properly. Come along, come along. I'll take you into she, this all right. This is the legend of a man and Aye, a horse. That's the reason I planned the whole met. thing. The story you of the Lone Ranger have a young and his great horse, Blackheart. Silver. The Lone Ranger, the worst outlaw in the West. His name was 
which can be. They have followed this trail for many weeks until finally they noticed that Come the footprints of the outlaw's horse right were fresh. Sure. We're close After to you, sir, you don't know. Oh, yes, now, <laughs> it's not ahead. that kind Came of a trap. Last time. <laughs> Maybe better oh, yeah. Sight. No. How are you, my dear? Please, Uncle. Please, Uncle. Pity. Uh, but I do a great deal more than you show. He missed me, but he shot my horse. Get after him. Uh, come now, come now. Up off your knees. Tonto's horse was tired like and no match in speed for the it's animal the Cavendish bike. road. The it outlaw escaped. Also necessary to be I don't know. How you can be so vicious. The old ranger standing beside his dead horse. A good horse, Tonto. And now, Monsieur de Beaujolais, we decided to keep up. Of course, must be faster. Allow me I to wish present that... my niece, Blanche. Oh, no. You've heard stories of a wild horse. Oh, wait, wait, surely wait, heaven wait. itself. Ah. Him seen near valley over there. Where's He's Cavendish? not the man. We'll be on the lookout I'll for the wild horse when we follow man. Cavendish. Is it so unfortunate you couldn't remember his name? It's true. I swear by the Blessed Virgin, I do not Otto's know this man. Otto's horse carried the Lone Ranger's saddle, his saddlebags and bridle, while the masked you, man and the Indian continued on foot along the outlaw's trail. Never, never had that pleasure. When they reached the top of a hill, Sire, I've not met your lovely they halted suddenly and stared at an awe-inspiring sight far though? down in the valley. But uh, it's never too late. They saw a great white stallion in a death-white a giant buffalo. The horse was plunging, rearing, charging, and darting wildly. Sire de Mascar, would you please be kind enough to explain what you mean? A coat of silver. Surely you you've heard of the this custom was the legendary man. white stallion. It's the one quite widely practiced. At least, so sir, I've never heard before uh, of such a maniac as I perceive you to be. I'll try to shoot the buffalo. And I've no intention of marrying anyone. Then may I ask what were your intentions, my boy? As he ran downhill, the oh, well, old ranger no watched the battle. Now. The sleek white Therefore, stallion was nimble and courageous when his strength the began to wane. The buffalo charged again and again. The splendid muscles of the white horse were slower in responding. Then too slow. He was caught by the buffalo's charge. Meanwhile, White crimson I stained his pure white coat. Another charge. Great. The white horse saw it coming and he Uncle, couldn't you dodge. Can't be he staggered earnest. and fell. The monster drew back and lowered his head to the death charge. I swear to you, I'll kill myself before I be forced on this young man. Two charge rang out. Come now, my dear. The buffalo dear shuddered now. from the impact of the it's masked man's bullet. It's possible that you think I'm lying, instant, that you still motionless. believe this is the man? Then Frank, fell. I do. And then you're wrong. I refuse not to leave and to consider this. You took it upon yourself to dishonor the name of our family. You forfeited all right whatsoever to question my designs. I consider it a duty to see that you're married with as little delay as possible. Out of the goodness of my heart, I've attempted to find the man of your choice. Truly I believe battered and done, bruised, the white stallion But if not, quietly, then I cannot the one jack straw. Is that perfectly you clear? Know, several days it's clear, sir, that you're a madman. The cared for the injured horse. My dear then nephew. I'm cold. not your nephew, nor will I be. You'd sooner die a thousand times. There was once more fire in Such his eye. A fury a against the inevitable. And but his head rate, was lifted you proudly. You have two hours to compose your difference. He's himself Pair again. Pair Foswell. Bring it up. Very strong. well, Messiah. Thank you. Horse. Place it there. I wonder if you'll take a saddle. This, Let's Monsieur de Beaulieu, is another of my little contrivances, and one that is hardly <laughs> less ingenious. No, it's not a way. Messiah, your accomplishments are of no interest to me whatsoever. Oh, oh, oh. I, I think you'll find this one most freedom. interesting. He's fought for it. You will notice that the upper container is filled with water. In exactly well, two hours, all of the water ah, will have dripped into the lower vessel, like and at that silver. time, I shall that return. Be a name for him. Remove the plug, Pierre Francois. Silver! He's still there! Well, Otto, he's coming back. So rarely appreciated. Just as if he knew what I said. And now I'm quite sure you will carry on your interview with Silver, you beauty. I'm in the halter, Otto. As the mighty stallion felt the halter, never met and my uncle from a chill, before. every instinct told he him didn't that he didn't arrange this with you. I've never laid eyes his freedom. on him. Certainly yet nothing was arranged with me, else I wouldn't be here. It wasn't gratitude that kept him there. It yeah, was something stronger, some mysterious bond of friendship. But you at least must be more aware of the circumstances. I can understand none of them. He heard the man's voice, and he liked it. It's Silver. not an easy thing for a Silver. girl to tell. We're going to be partners. Whatever you may think of me now. I fear you shall think the worse when I've finished. The saddle. Oh, the words of no the horse. horse like that. Take saddle. There never was a horse a like this. Thank you, Mister. Now, Silver, we're going to work together. I've lived the horse all was my wild life and my unused uncle. to the ways of men and, and the weight of a saddle and a rider. But the masked man was a kind Three teacher. Three months ago, he was gentle a young yet firm, captain of the guard and began to stand near me in the church. The stallion seemed to sense well, the desires of the lone ranger and did his I best to cooperate. I gave him no encouragement to do so. He learned quickly, and after several days of training. 
He was ready. He was. Follow me, Toto. I'm going after Cavendish. As a matter of fact, Montenegro. very. After a while, he began to pass me hoops. No hoops had ever beat the flames like those thundering hoops of the great Mount horse, Silver. During the past few days, Cavendish had gotten reason. far away, but the masked man and Toto trailed him relentlessly with only a minimum of rest. It took days to cut down the outlaw's lead, but at long last, so Cavendish came into view. With me on there the he Montenegro! The mighty stallion responded with a new burst of speed. I'm sure he Cavendish no fired hope. wild shots over his shoulder I, until his I, gun was no, empty. His horse, though powerful and fast, was no match for the charging silver. Fear and panic filled the outlaw's face. He heard the hoof beats ever nearer. And then the masked man shout, I want you, Cavendish! I've been kept in my room all day. The masked man's avowed mission was accomplished. That's it. The last of the Cavendish gang was captured to be tried by law and punished for his crimes. Has my uncle brought the but there were many others himself? whose criminal He's plans were to be challenged by the Lone Ranger, I know that his he may faithful not have been Indian companion Toto, and his great horse Silver. to be forced silver. into a situation with you, a perfect stranger. Your regard for me is quite clear, my dear. I regret appearing as a disappointment to you. I believe you said he was very handsome. If that were all... There's more. I, I mean, monsieur, that you yourself are quite handsome. Mm -hmm. But it's so... Oh, no, it's really no use. Well, please understand me. I'm not urging you in any way. Urging, monsieur? I'm accustomed to meeting young ladies upon occasion who are quite ready to accept me as something beside a convenient substitute for some handsome captain of the guard. I've no doubt of it, monsieur. And to correct a mistaken impression you seem to have... I'm well aware that you're doing no urging. And were you to do so, I should neither listen to nor give it any consideration whatsoever. It's well that we both understand one another. Quite so. And that being the case, Mademoiselle de Maltois, I wonder if you'll be good enough to conduct me to your uncle. With the greatest of pleasure, monsieur. I've no doubt but what this little matter can be settled very quickly and with as much honor as possible to everybody concerned. <laughs> weren't necessary. Already harmonious accord rises triumphant. On the contrary side, the Maltra, your assumption is entirely false. Oh, what a pity. Well, Père Francois, there's nothing to it. We'll simply have to wait a while longer. As you say, Monsieur. I fear it may be much longer than you think. In fact, forever. Mm, that's a very long time indeed. And, uh, and you, my dear niece, what are your sentiments in the matter? I will not marry this man. Do what you may, Uncle. I will not marry him. Ah, right back where we started. Can it be that our young friend is lacking in perception, Pierre Francois? It is possible, Messiah. I'm not at any rate lacking in a sense of honorable conduct. Dragged in here against my will, I've addressed your niece in the manner of a gentleman. I found her charming, lovely, delightful. Monsieur. But now I have the honor of declining your offer of her hand. Let that end the matter. Oh, uh, it's not as simple as that. Take a look from my window there, hmm? And tell me what you see on the wall beneath it. What do you mean? See for yourself. Whatever it is can have no bearing on the matter. There's an iron ring set in the wall. Quite so, and uh, uh, fastened to the ring? A rope. Right. So we have two elements. And to complete our little diagram, we need a third one. That element is, at the moment, firmly attached to your body. I'm referring, sir, to your neck. Uncle, no! And may I inquire the purpose of the dogs there in the courtyard below? Are they also a part of your devilish plans? My dear young man, a body doesn't hang in ropes forever, you know. <gasps> you maniac! Even murder doesn't stop Ooh, you. Oh, that's such a nasty word. Let us confine ourselves to the bald facts. At the end of your two hours, you will prepare yourself either to marry my niece or to kick out your life while you swing at the end of that rope. There's no other alternative. I think there's one. Between gentlemen, at any rate. Arm yourself, sir. You fool. You think for a moment that if I'd regarded your sword as a threat, you'd still be wearing it? Père Francois, will you open that door to the passage, please? Of course, Messiah. I'll be most happy to. Gentlemen... Show this rash young buck the color of your steel. 
Uh, whether he likes to admit it or not, Monsieur de Beaulieu, one day a man grows too old to fight his own battles and must hire others to do it for him. Close the door, Père Francois. Then you'll not fight? Do I seem a fool? There'll be no fighting and no haughty refusal to marry Manish. You found her charming. Well and good. But I'll tell you this. Were she as common as the Paris road, more hideous to the gargoyle over my door, you'd not spurn the hand of a maltois and ever live to tell of it. Alive and married you'll be, or dead and hanging from that window, and soon after, food for the dogs. It's one or the other. Well, make up your mind. <laughs> Monsieur de Beaulieu, why do you not sit down? Your concern is most gratifying, mademoiselle. But since I have such a short time to live, I doubt that I'll grow very tired. If the time be short, then why do we waste it in formal speech? As you will. Listen to him. The drip, drip, drip of that devilish clock like an artery opened and life's blood itself dripping off. Well, I've sat here and thought and thought until my whole mind's in a great whirl. Please, you... You really shouldn't trouble yourself so much. Oh, I can't bear to have you sling for my sake. Monsieur de Beaulieu, I will marry you gladly. You must think then that I stand very much in fear of death. Oh, no, no. I, I've had reason to see that you're no coward. I've asked for no pity if the thing has to be. Then that's the end of it. Oh, sir, you misunderstood me. I, the great nobility with which you face my uncle should have removed all question about your bravery had such doubts existed. That is most kind of you to say so. Not of course that anyone could raise such questions once they'd seen you. Death's another incident. That's all. Oh, but life's a better one. You'll agree then. I'm afraid you underrate the difficulty. What you're generosity offers me my pride prevents accepting in this moment of noble feeling toward me aren't you forgetting what you already owe to someone else monsieur he never really mattered mademoiselle my very life's the forfeit here one I'll pay gladly if it be of service to a lady but to tell me it's for something that never really oh, mattered don't, don't be so cruel cruel you forget I'm the one who's going to die not you I've not forgotten monsieur yes You'll enjoy tomorrow's sun like any other days. And tomorrow night, perhaps you'll see him again. And of course, I'll be forgotten. Oh, no, never. But it's all a man can expect when he's born into the world, death at last. And some piece of ironic misfortune. Oh, don't say those things. I can't bear it. Oh, if, if I've said anything to wound you, I'm sorry. It was... It was for your own sake, not mine. Thank you. Please. It's a bitter thing, my dear, to, to see you in such distress that giving my life itself for you can't help it. I'm sorry. I'll try to be braver. Is there no way at all in which I can serve you? Either now or afterwards? Only by letting me think of you as a friend for the brief time that's left to us. By forgetting for the moment that I'm an awkward intruder thrown here by circumstance. That's all. And afterward? What does it matter? The closer you come to it, the clearer you see that death's no more than a, a dark and dusty corner where a man climbs into his tomb and shuts the door after himself. Oh, monsieur. I've only a few friends now. And once I'm dead, I've no doubt that I'll have none. You forget Blanche de Maltois. You're very sweet. Any young man in France would be glad to trade places with me and die for you. You value the small service I do you far beyond its worth. I'll not have you thinking so meanly of yourself. 
Look at me. Would you say that I am beautiful? I think so. I think the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. I'm glad of that. Tell me, is there a man in France who can say he's been asked in marriage by a beautiful maiden, asked from her own lips and refused her to her face? Oh, no. I know you're a man and have despised such a triumph. But any woman knows more of what's precious in love. But remember, you asked me out of the pity of your heart, not for love. Are you so sure of that? Must I bear my very soul like a merchant showcase? You're very good. As good as you're beautiful. I'll not forget it for the time that's left me. Very well. I, too, have a pride of my own. You turn back now from your word, I'd no more marry you than I would any stranger off the street. It's it's a small love that shies at a little pride. The dawn's starting to break. Yes. My uncle and his men will come here any moment. What shall we say to him? Anything you will. Oh. All of my life I'll weep for you. And weep the more because it was you. If I'm wrong, it's a great price I'm paying for it. One I'd not pay if I didn't care for you so dearly. Careful. Oh, no, it's you who are being kind. It was in the moment your uncle brought me into you and you raised your face to look at me. That's when I knew. Oh, strange. For it was then I felt it, too. Well, you, you've seen already that I'm not afraid to die. Oh, you're not. I know it. Oh, Marcia, is it really true, not something born of pity? I swear by all that's holy. I love you, Denny. Oh, my beloved. And I can tell you now that I love you, too. Even after all you've heard. I can remember none of it. The captain's no name. No matter. I love you. Oh, my darling. I love you more than my, my life and my soul. Blush, my I darling, love I love you. you. I love you, Blush. Well. Love you. Uncle. Well, well, well. It's most gratifying to see this little matter settled in such a congenial fashion. Good morning, my dear nephew. I have nothing to say to you, sir. You're a vicious and unprincipled old man. Oh, that's most ungracious of you. No, no. At the very worst, I'm no more than a very wise old man. One who's lived a long time and, and seen a great many remarkable things. An old man who's learned all about such mysteries as uh, the love of life and uh, <laughs> love. The Sire de Maltois' Door by Robert Louis Stevenson was adapted for radio by Les Crutchfield and produced and directed by William N. Robeson with Elliot Lewis as Denny, Peggy Weber as Blanche, and Ramsey Hill as the Sire de Maltois. The special musical score was conceived and conducted by Cy Fewer. <laughs> Escape is presented by the Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations each week at this time. Next week, we invite you to escape to Egypt of 3,500 years ago with Arthur Conan Doyle's fascinating tale of the Ring of Toth. And so good night until next week at this time, when again it will be time to escape. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.